Hi, everyone. Welcome to One Question with Pastor Adam. And hey, I'm Adam, and uh, this is One Question. Uh, so welcome, everyone. I am pastor to believers and to doubters, to unfaithful Christians and to faithful atheists. And uh, we are here to ask questions because Jesus wasn't afraid of questions. He dealt with questions all the time. Uh, and so do we. So uh, no question is off, off limits. Uh, no, all doubts are welcome here, friends. That's what we do here at uh, the Raven Foundation Facebook page and at the Clackamas United Church of Christ Facebook page. Hi, Kat, it's good to, uh, it's good to see you. I'm sending you a heart right back, Kat. Um, I, uh, <laughs> here's life during uh, COVID era. Before we went live, my wife came in and just dumped an yet another pile of laundry for folding on our bed. <laughs> they just keep, keep coming back. It's no fun. Make the laundry stop. Um, I have three kids. I should teach them how to do laundry, shouldn't I? <laughs> here's how to fold. Oh man, teenagers. If you know how to get, here's a question. How do you get teenagers to fold laundry? Anybody, anybody? Yeah, maybe next episode. Uh, I'll bring you on as a guest. <laughs> Hey, Holly, good to see you. Uh, friends, today's question is uh, one that one that I struggle with, one that we ask frequently, and um, it's this. Um, my, um, it comes from Jenny, and Jenny asks this. Can you talk about real and deep forgiveness, especially in cases when someone isn't sorry, never apologizes, continues the offense or expects you to just wipe the slate clean. Mm. Mm. That is that is a tough one. Linnea, yeah, the laundry is hard. That's hard. Forgiveness is 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 just as hard. No, forgiveness is harder than doing the laundry. This is tough, Jenny. Your question um gets at me at a deep level. So I, uh, there is no easy answer to this question. Uh, friends, if you have comments um, about forgiveness, uh, maybe a way that you've moved towards forgiveness, especially with someone who never apologizes. Do you have someone in, in your life like this who never apologizes and continues the offense or and expects you to wipe the slate clean? This is tough. This is tough stuff. I put together five steps that I see uh, that I think are helpful. Um, obviously, I'm a pastor, so I'm going to talk about God stuff. Um, but I, I, one of the things that I want to say about God stuff and forgiveness is how forgiveness has often been used as a spiritual a weapon, uh, an abuse, um, so I'm going to get to that too. So, but first, um, friends and Jenny in particular, I want to tell you this: that the word that Jesus uses for forgiveness, you know how he says, "Forgive seven times, seventy times." The word that he uses here is a Greek word um, called aphiemi. In Greek. The word for forgiveness that is in the New Testament is aphiemi. And the word is slightly different than what we usually think about forgiveness. And I think this is really important when it comes to the spirituality of forgiveness. Uh, the word aphiemi means um, it means it means to create space between. You see, usually when we think of forgiveness, we think, oh, I have to reconcile with this person who has, as Jenny says, has hurt me or who refuses to show or admit any complicity or guilt in the ways that they have hurt me and they continue to do the practice. Forgiveness might mean reconciliation with someone who has hurt us in the past but it doesn't necessarily mean reconciliation with someone who has hurt us in the past. Forgiveness, when Jesus talks about forgive seven times, 70 times, <laughs> uh, he's talking about a pattern of life that 
is is about not letting what someone does to us um, control us or keep us down. Um, it's it's about it can be about creating space between you and the other person. It can be uh, basically this. It can be an act of saying, I wish you well, but I'm going to create space between us because I need that boundary. Forgiveness is not about saying that what you did to me doesn't matter. Forgiveness says what you did to me matters. And I might need a barrier, a boundary between me and you so that you're not in my life anymore. That might be forgiveness, afiemi, creating space between you and this other person who has hurt you. And that's okay. In fact, that's healthy. It might mean you might be able to even come to the point over time where you say, I wish you well. I, I wish you success. I wish you well, but I just can't be in your life right now. And if that is what forgiveness means, then then go for it. It doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily mean reconciliation. It means creating healthy barriers and boundaries for you um, to get beyond this, this thing that's happened between you. So that's been helpful for me as I, uh, as I learn more about forgiveness as I, as I grow older. Um, I've, I've noticed in my life, um, once, once I got to a certain age, I've, been able to see how I have hurt people in the past and how other people have hurt me in the past. And sometimes you just need to, it's like this, there's a passage in the scriptures uh, in, I forget what gospel it is, um, might be in Matthew, where um, the Jesus tells his disciples to go preach the, the word to the towns, go preach the good news to the towns. And uh, the, the disciples say, well, what happens if the towns don't accept us? Should we call down hellfire and brimstone upon those towns, you know, get them back a little bit, uh, kind of like what they did to Sodom and Gomorrah? Should we go back to that? They have that model for them about people who reject, uh, who reject the gospel message. And you know what Jesus responds with? <laughs> he says, no, are you kidding me? Don't do that. He says, just shake the dust off of your feet and move on. Sometimes in these relationships where people reject us or they hurt us and it's a pattern that they have and they refuse to admit any complicity in this, sometimes the best thing to do is to just shake the dust off of your feet and move on. That's afiemi. Uh, that's not, that's not um, building up resentment inside of you by staying in this relationship and saying, ah, this person is just such a jerk. If you're in that point, Afiemi, I think maybe the healthiest thing to do is to not just be like, oh, this person's a jerk. And if you can get away from them and say, I have to not be in a relationship with you, do that. Um, make structures in your life where you can do that. Um, so that's the, that's the first point. <laughs> Eight minutes into this, and we're just on step one. So I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do five keys to forgiveness, uh, and Afiemi is the first key um, in my life to forgiveness. The second one uh, is is don't force yourself to forgive too quickly. Um, this is the spiritual abuse that I talked about uh, at the beginning. Uh, Christians, pastors can force can can tend to say you have to forgive now. Um, Jesus says, forgive, 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 forgive. And if you're not forgiving, then uh, you're not a true Christian. You're not really following Jesus. That's that's spiritual abuse. Don't feel like you have to listen. Please don't listen to that. Don't feel like you have to listen to that. Don't listen to that. Forgiveness is a process. It's a it's a it's not something where you just wake up one morning. And all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to forgive this person. It might be that. You might come to that. For me, it's been much more of a process. 
for me, it's not something that just snap your fingers and magically you've forgiven this person. Uh, it's a process. I was listening to one, here's what I mean by spiritual abuse, by the way, when it comes to this forgiveness. I was I was doing a little research on this before listening to some YouTube videos and there was this guy on there who said, who said, when it comes to forgiveness, you have to forgive that person. Do you know why? Because Jesus went to the cross and forgave you. You might not owe it to that person to forgive, but you are in debt to Jesus to forgive. And I was like, oh, excuse me while I throw up. <laughs> Did a little bit of throw up come into you when I said that? I'm like, no, that is Jesus. That is spiritual abuse. That's what I mean by forgiveness as spiritual abuse. It's like, Jesus is pointing his finger at you saying, oh, you have to forgive. And if you don't forgive right away, then you're not in a good relationship with me, right? That is spiritual abuse. This is going to happen over time. It's a process. And it may not even come to fruition within our lifetime. Forgiveness might be something that we live into. I don't know the mystery of the mystery of eternity. Forgiveness might be something we live into after um, our life. After our life, I don't know. Uh, I'm a little agnostic about all of that. But don't don't allow a pastor to tell you to give you spiritual abuse and say. You have to forgive otherwise because you owe a debt to Jesus. Um, God loves you. It, this, this, isn't, this isn't about a debt you owe to anyone. This is about our own spiritual, physical, and mental health because they're all connected, right? This is about um, the cliche that uh, holding stuff in and not forgiving is like, uh, and holding resentment in is like drinking rat poison and hoping the other person dies. Um, there's, there's truth to that cliche. And once again, part of not drinking the rat poison is putting up the barrier and shaking the dust off of your feet and uh, moving on. So these are all related. Um, uh, forgiveness is a, is a process. You move, you move through it. Um, in uh, this, so two, number two and three are connected. I connected them. The fourth step that I wanted to say is some practical advice that Jesus gives. And this is hard for me. It's always been hard for me. It might be hard for you too, because I tend to be somebody who uh, avoids conflict. Um, I'm not good at entering into conflict with someone who has hurt me, uh, which which means that I tend to stay at the level of resentment towards others, which is not good for me, um, and it's not good for them either. <laughs> so Jesus provides some practical advice in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, about how to deal with someone that you're in a conflict with. Uh, someone who has hurt you, um, and how you can do this uh, it, as long as it's safe, right? As long as you feel safe. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 that if if somebody sins against you, if somebody hurts you, uh, go directly to that person and talk with them. And Jenny, it sounds like you've done that. It sounds like you've gone directly to this person who has hurt you and they refuse to admit any guilt or wrongdoing in this and um, they don't say they're sorry. Uh, and good for you for having done that. That's a huge step forward. And I want to say right now, Jenny, um, that I'm not particularly good at this. It shows me uh, some really good strength that you have, some really deep spirituality that you have, that you have been able to go to this person and confront them, uh, maybe one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Jesus says if doing it one-on-one -on -one doesn't work, then you might bring um, another person in uh, to go and talk with uh, this person with you. Here's how, here's how I have usually done this. <laughs> I have usually not gone directly to this person, but I have often gone to 
maybe one of our mutual friends or a coworker and say, yeah, do you know what that person did to me? What a jerk. What a jerk. And this is a way for me to get somebody else to unite with me over and against that person. Uh, much better, Jesus says, to go directly to the person. Now, there are times when you may need support. And so Jesus says, yeah, go to another person. Go get some support because uh, you may need it, especially if there's a safety issue. Um, and take that person with you uh, so that you can um, maybe talk with that person or get an arbitrator. Uh, get somebody who will act as an arbitrator, not so much to take sides, but to just make sure that each side is listening to what the other side has to say. Um, that's like crucially important. And then Jesus says, if that doesn't work, uh, bring in more people, bring in the reinforcements, <laughs> bring in more people. Jesus is talking about a congregation, a church body, bring in the church body to try to arbitrate between the two of you. And if it still doesn't uh, work out, then Jesus says, uh, treat the person as a tax collector or a Gentile. Um, and this has been interpreted in multiple ways. Jesus um, didn't exclude tax collectors. In fact, he brought one into his, uh, into his disciples. Um, and he also didn't exclude Gentiles. Um, some folks have said that treat them as a tax collector and a Gentile is to exclude them. So it's kind of ambiguous. It's difficult to understand what Jesus exactly meant by treat them as a tax collector and a Gentile. But the option I want to say to you, Jenny, and to all of you, the option is always there to shake the dust off of your feet and move on. That's always that's always a good option, the, the boundaries that we have to put up in our lives. Jesus, this is the fifth point that I wanted to make. Um, Jesus on the cross says one of the most uh, mysterious and amazing things, which is, which is one of the things that keeps me being a Christian. And um, I don't know if this is going to be helpful to any of you who are going through the pain of what Jenny is talking about. Um, so if this isn't helpful for you, feel free to put it to the side. Um, it's all good. But Jesus says this thing that um, kind of gives me empathy for myself when I have hurt people and also empathy for others uh, when they have hurt me. And he says while he's on the cross dying, he has this prayer uh, where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I will probably spend my lifetime trying to figure out what exactly that means. Uh, but but what I, what I come to think of it in response to Jenny, your great question, is that um, Jesus doesn't say from the cross, I forgive you. I don't know why he doesn't say from the cross, I forgive you, but he prays that God forgives them. Now, there may be times when, I don't know if this is what Jesus meant by that, uh, but there may be times when it's too hard for us to forgive someone. I'm not, spot, I'm not just talking about creating space between us and them. I'm talking about like, like letting them go and getting past like the resentment that I have for this person. There may be times when the best that we can muster up is... Uh, not to force ourselves to forgive this person even over time, depending on how, how awful it's been, but to say um, maybe the first step is to say, God, I need you. <laughs> I can't do this. I need you to do this. I need you to forgive this person because I can't. Maybe that's the first step. And the second point of, of this is when Jesus says, for they know not what they do. Uh, I have been in my life caught up into uh, certain patterns uh, throughout my life where I, uh, I, this is the non-conscious, the unconscious that Jesus is speaking about. Jesus is the first person, interestingly, to talk about the non conscious or the unconscious 2000 years before Freud uh, talks about we do things and we don't know that we're doing them 
Jesus is saying, forgive them because they're doing this stuff and they don't know that they're doing it. Uh, what does Jesus mean by that? Clearly, the people who killed Jesus and put him up on the cross knew what they were doing on some level. They knew that they were killing him. So what does Jesus mean by this? Well, there can be there can be a sense um, when we don't know, when we get caught up in something that's bigger than ourselves. And I think this is what Jesus is referring to, that oftentimes when we're in a, and we're, we're in a crowd, we get in the crowd mentality. And the crowd mentality can often be, we can snowball. And it can often be like uh, pointing fingers at someone. And that can lead us to something bigger than ourselves. An accusation leads to a group of people making an accusations. And that's how Jesus ended up getting killed. And individually, we get caught up into the group dynamic, the group behavior, the mob mentality. And that, I think, is what Jesus is referring to. When we get caught up into this mob mentality that is over and against someone else, we become unaware or blinded to the full humanity of the other person. And when I've gotten into traps of hurting other people, I have become unaware. This is not an excuse. I hope this doesn't come out, come across as an excuse, but I've become unaware of the full humanity of what someone else has done. Um, I say that's not an excuse for me because as I look back, uh, I realize how I've messed up. <laughs> and hopefully you learn from it. And this is one of the keys. Um, Jenny, it sounds like the person that you are in this relationship with hasn't learned. And that might be the biggest tragedy. Because the only way to learn in this life for some reason the only way. I don't, that's too extreme. But one of the major ways that we learn in this life is by making mistakes, is by being able to look back on our lives and say, yeah, I messed up. I messed up and I'm, I'm going to do better. Maybe I need some, uh, maybe I need some help. Maybe I need some therapy. Uh, maybe I need an accountability partner, uh, to help me through this. But that's one of the keys, uh, to understanding that I have found in my life is um, to learn to move forward. You have to be able to say, I'm sorry, and admit mistakes to move forward. And this is the final point that I want to make, is that that is exactly what happens to the disciples. This might, this has allowed me to have more empathy for myself and for others as well. Um, the disciples throughout the Gospels, this is the amazing part about the Gospels, is that the disciples, the quote unquote, some of the heroes of the Gospels that we venerate, are seen throughout the Gospels as missing the point over and over and over again of what Jesus was teaching them. The male disciples. <laughs> The women disciples, for some reason, they understood that Jesus was about service. But the men tended to miss the point over and over again. And Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, says to Jesus near the end of his life that he will stick with Jesus even if he has to die. Even if he has to go to the cross, he will stick with Jesus. And Peter, or Jesus says to Peter, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. And sure enough, that's what Jesus, that's what Peter does. Peter denies Jesus three times. Peter even abandons Jesus when Jesus goes to the cross. The women, again, go to the cross and they're there with Jesus. But his closest, what many, who many say is his closest male disciple abandons him. That had to have been so hurtful, I would imagine. Jesus didn't respond to Peter's abandoning him and betraying him 
by abandoning and betraying Jesus. And this, this is the key to understanding. For me, this is the key to understanding what God is like. Je- Jesus doesn't abandon, doesn't mimic, uh, doesn't um, imitate, uh, doesn't respond to Peter in the way that Peter responded to Jesus. <laughs> we often think that if we uh, turn our back on God or turn our back on Jesus, uh, that God will turn God's back on us, that we're damned. That's not how God responds. Jesus responds to Peter by going to Peter and saying, I I, I still believe in you. You can still do this. Yes, you messed up, but I'm coming back to you. This is what the resurrection is all about. Jesus does not come back for revenge, does not come back to hold their sins against them, that they abandon Jesus to death. Jesus comes back and says, you messed up, but I still believe in you. There's something really human about that. And there's something really divine about that too. Divine in the sense of, uh, of this radical forgiveness that, that, that to kind of get at your question, Jenny, is something that I have often tried to live into in my life imperfectly. Um, But it's something that I kind of aspire towards. (laughs) Um, So so those are some of my thoughts. Those are the six, I think, they merge together, six steps towards forgiveness, um, which is where I am at in my life right now with this really important question that Jenny asks, and I'll go through some of the comments um, because I'm still growing in this. And um, I know that uh, um, that you all have some really great, great questions. So Anita says, I have found throughout my spiritual journey that when I forgive too soon, I don't do the work I need to move past the event slash emotion. Sometimes the forgiveness can be instantaneous and be real, but I find for myself, I really have to want it for myself and the other person. Yes, Anita, this is brilliant. This is where where far too often Christianity has been used in a spiritual abusive way where we say, you must forgive now. No, I didn't say this. I meant to say this. So thank you, Anita. Um, Sometimes you got to go through the anger. That's, that's really human. You got to move through the anger that you might feel. Um, try to do that in a healthy way. Uh, and what do I mean by healthy? Um, uh, a way that's not, not destructive to yourself, to your soul, and even to the other person. But if you can find a place where you can express your anger, that is you got to do, you got to go through that in order to get to the other side. Um, Crucial point, Anita, thank you for this. Um, Amira, oh, Amira, and not beating ourselves up over mistakes. Yes, that's why, Amira, that's why I find the disciples and their stories so important because they're able to, uh, to not beat themselves up. They're able to to have the forgiveness, the love of God enter into their lives and be like, yeah, I messed up and I'm not gonna beat myself up over it. There was one video that I watched, I can't remember what it was, um, but they were talking about like uh, cats, (laughs) cats, Um, animals have this way of doing exactly what Amira is talking about. Like Like they'll mess up but they'll like forget about it. Like they're they'll they'll mess up, they'll do something wrong, and they'll just like like five seconds later they've forgotten about it. Um, but they've also like learned about it. There's some kind of muscle memory, or I don't know how animals work, but um, like my dog, there are times when my dog knows shouldn't do something and doesn't do it, but it doesn't spend the rest of its time going, oh, oh, I feel so bad and beating themselves up about it. There's a certain, uh, my wife is really good at that too. Just like moving, moving on and not beating yourself up over it. Um, crucial point. Uh, Rebecca says, this is a mind blowing journey to take on. 
it's like little moments need more of our meditation. Yeah, meditation, prayer. Uh, hook up with Amira for some meditation. She does an amazing job um, with meditation. Courtney says facts. Thank you. Capital riots. Yeah, Melanie, that's exactly it. Um, the mob mentality. Uh, I think that I was getting at capital riots. And, uh, you know, this is something that I keep having to remind myself um, about, too, is um, especially when it comes to racism, that that I get caught up in mind and in, in uh, a mentality, a mob mentality that's bigger than me. Um, that's the structural aspect of racism throughout the United States that infects me. That's the mob mentality that I just kind of grew up with, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Um, that's the systemic aspect of racism. And how do how the, how does this relate to forgiveness? How do I move forward uh, forgiving myself for participating in, this is also the unconscious element that Jesus is getting at. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I grew up in a system, like many of you, maybe, sorry, all of us grew up in a system. Um, I am trying to take things on personally so that I don't project onto other people. Um, so I grew up in a system that had systemic racism built into it. And I've acted that out throughout my life. And there are still times when I act that out in my life. It's a part of me. So how do I forgive myself? Part of it is what Jesus says, for they know not what they do. And over time, I've become more aware, more conscious, more woke, <laughs> to the racism that infects me. And I've once I become more aware of it, I'm also able to see, oh, that's, that's something that was bigger than me and it's inside of me. And I'm able to move forward with a way of forgiving myself for it because it's not entirely me that's messed up in it, although it is me and I need to take responsibility for it. It's also something that's in my culture that I, can forgive inside of myself in order to move forward. And as Amira beautifully pointed out, not beat myself up over it and just move ahead. So Elizabeth says, I avoid confrontation 100%. It is my lesson to learn to do it tactfully and without fear. Elizabeth, you are not alone. I am, I am with you. Um, thank you, Jen. I'm glad that it's been helpful. Uh, America confronting sucks. It is needed. Yes, my dear friend, it is. It is. Um, okay. Uh, a boundary, uh, Holly says a boundary can be an act of compassion. Yes. I think that's, that's, um, so much Holly. I wish that I could bring you on and ask you about that. That is fantastic. Yeah. Boundaries, act of compassion for for the person creating the boundary and also for the other person too. Um, absolutely. Excellent point. Um, the forgiveness, uh, Stephanie says, the forgiveness is to unburden my spirit and not theirs. Yes. Whatever you, I, this is such a great point, Stephanie. I have had to learn that I am, I can only control and I don't do it really well. I can only control myself and I'm not always good at that, <laughs> but um, I can't control if the other person's spirit is unburdened. I can't control. And this gets to, this gets to Jenny's, Jenny's point. Like we, there's, there's one person in my life who is super toxic. I've had to put up the boundaries, which has meant that I can't see this other person who's super important in my life. Um, and I can't control what the toxic person does with their life. I can't control them detoxifying. <laughs> I can just put up the boundary. Uh, unfortunately, that affects me not being able to see someone in my life that I love immensely. Um, and that's just part of the pain of life, I guess. That's life. Sad to say. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, Melanie, we also need to forgive ourselves. Uh, huge. 
huge point. Anita says, uh, how wonderful it would be to live a life without feeling guilty all the time. Oh, to be a cat. <laughs> uh, Melanie says, my dog, when I scold him, won't get over it for about half an hour. Yet when I get scolded, it takes me days. <laughs> That's good. I just like tend to nurse resentment because I hate the conflict. I hate, I hate going into it. But um, as Amira says, it's it's supposed to do it. Cat, yes, nicely done, cat. You are the cat. I love it. <laughs> with age, I've learned to not hold on to guilt. Cat, that would be interesting. I'd love to talk with you sometime about how you've been able to let go of that over time with age. Um, you are full of wisdom, and I would love to I would love to learn more. Uh, Amira, yes, Adam, I'm blessed to struggle life with you. I love you. Oh, I love you too. Yeah, boundaries are. Uh, biggest form of self-love. Amen to that. Uh, so friends, thank you for being here. If you have other steps that have helped you move towards forgiveness, I would love to read uh, more about them. This is something, I'm 42, um, still trying to figure this thing out. Still trying to figure out this thing we call life. So um Yes, over time, uh, learn to not hold on to grudges. That's really good, Kat. Um, Rebecca says, yes, Kat, I need to know how to do this too. So, so uh, friends, thank you for being here and having this conversation with me. And if you have questions, you can uh, feel free to reach me on Facebook. What are the other? Instagram, email me. Uh, I'm now up on... TikTok, so you can uh, contact us there. Um, and uh, Raven Foundation pages, Clackamas UCC pages, and um, friends, we will do this all again next week on Thursday at three o'clock Central, one o'clock Pacific. Um, so until then, I hope you have a great week and uh, grace and peace be with you. <laughs>